speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Margaret Horton had a risky job. February 14, 1945, leading Royal Air Force aircraft woman, Margaret Horton was assigned a familiar job. Sit on the horizontal stabilizer, or the tail, of a Spitfire airplane as it taxied down the runway to prepare for takeoff on a windy day. And this was such a normal part of Margaret's job that no one remembered to tell the pilot that she was going to be on the back of his plane. And the normal routine was for the tail sitter to waggle the aircraft's elevator before the pilot turned to accelerate down the runway to take off so that he would know she was hopping off so he'd take his foot off the accelerator for just a second so that she could. But this time the pilot made a casual gesture out of the cockpit of the airplane and for some reason Margaret took it to mean, oh, he wants me to sit here for a minute more. Well, that was a big mistake. And as the Spitfire accelerated down the runway, Margaret had the good sense to quickly flop her body across the tail of the airplane, knowing that it would be hard for anyone to have the strength to hold themselves onto the plane, hoping that the wind would hold her on. And there she was, flying off to Germany, you know, to bomb the Germans. Another maintenance person who'd seen what was happening ran off to tell the flight sergeant, and he ran to the control tower and just said to the pilot, just make a quick circuit and come back and land. He didn't even tell them that he had a person on the back of his plane. <laughs> so finally when Margaret landed, she was relieved to be back on the ground, and she said, after a change of underwear and a cigarette, I'll be ready to go back to work. <laughs> Of course, she was also fined for losing her beret on the flight. <laughs> Margaret had a risky job. And because I, like you, live in a risk-adverse society, I'm fascinated by stories like Margaret's. It's hard for me to imagine working in a place where part of my regular job is to sit on the tail of an airplane before it takes off. But the idea that any of us could live and work without risk is really a new idea, and it's completely untrue. Every people, every generation has had days that have reminded them of the risk of living. For some of you here, maybe it was December 7th, 1941, for many of us, it was September 11th, 2001. And yet, despite that, our society continues to collectively tell ourselves the lie that living can be safe. And it's a radical notion that only Americans and maybe some Western Europeans might try to live by. Don't misunderstand me. I love seat belts and airbags and food safety inspections and all of it. But my point is, is that in some of your lifetimes, our culture has shifted from the idea that life is dangerous and we have to deal with it to a large scale collective attempt to fool ourselves to believing we can control the unknown. Life is risky, and the truth is, discipleship, following Jesus, is also risky. So what does risk have to do with the abundance that we see in John 6? Um, in the gospel, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. And this huge crowd followed him. And when he got down to the other side of the hill, he sat down and he saw this, this crowd coming. And the scriptures tell us there are 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. And he says, the Bible says, he said to Philip to test him, where can we get enough bread for all of these people to eat? 
And Philip said, 200 silver pieces wouldn't be enough to buy enough bread for every person just to get one piece. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, here's a little boy with two barley loaves and two fish, but surely they are not much among so many. The gospel doesn't say it, but I imagine that Jesus has a big smile on his face at this point. And we all know what happened next. But this wasn't just a miracle, according to John's gospel. It was a sign. And a sign points to something else. So what is the message this sign is pointing to? N.T. Wright says, nothing in the Gospel of John is there by accident. And this is the second time in John's Gospel that he's told us this is happening at Passover time. The first time was when he cleansed the temple and drove out the money changers. And the third time will be when he's going to the cross to die. So it's important that we know this is the Passover. So what happened at the Passover? What happened when the Israelites left Egypt? You know, they, they put the blood of the lamb over the door. The angel of death passed over. They went out of the city. The Egyptian army chased them. The waters were parted. They escaped the Egyptian army. But then they're wandering in the desert, starving. And God gives them manna from heaven. And then we read later that Moses said, Someday a prophet like me will come and he will lead you to freedom. And the Jewish people always thought, that's the Messiah. And John is going out of his way to tell them, the prophet like Moses has come. He fed you in the wilderness just like Moses did. And he has control over the weather, over the water, just like Moses did. And the people get the message. It says in verses 14 and 15, the people realized that God was at work among them and what Jesus had just done. And they said, this is the prophet for sure. The one we've been waiting for right here in Galilee. And here's the key verse I want you to notice. Because in the old scripture, in the Old Testament, when they got the manna, they weren't supposed to pick up more than they needed for just that day, and if they took more, then it would rot in their house. But there's a key difference in this text, and it's in verse, I don't know what verse it is, but it's in there. <laughs> and it says, when the people were full, Jesus said to his disciples, gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. And it says the disciples went to work and they filled 12 baskets full of leftovers. And this is the difference. The people ate so much and there was so much bread and fish that they could pick up 12 baskets remaining and they entrusted them to the disciples to go and feed the people who missed the meal. Well, that is us this morning. You and I have been given baskets of bread and fish. And our Lord has told, told us to go out and feed the people who have missed the meal. There is abundance in the kingdom of God. There's enough for everyone. There is room for everyone. The problem with abundance is that it's scary. Abundance is risky. Scarcity is easy to understand because every single one of us here understands fear. And if I believe there won't be enough food, there won't be enough water, there won't be enough money. There won't be enough love. There won't be enough fellowship. There won't be enough. Then it gives me permission to afford it. To build a bigger barn. To save all of it 
for myself. Scarcity comes from fear. Scarcity comes from small thinking. Scarcity is easy to control and understand. And yet Jesus told his disciples, gather up the fragments, fill up the baskets, so that none will be wasted. We have a dangerous job. We're to go out in faith and share this abundant love of Christ with the world. And we're supposed to do it without fear. Somewhere along the way, this is the main thing I want to do here this morning. So it's been boring up to this point. I understand Bible lessons, they tend to do that. It's okay. Clue in there. Somewhere we got the idea that Christianity is simply concerned about not doing anything wrong. And when I was a kid, this is what I believed faith was all about. Don't smoke, right? Don't drink. You know, you can kiss her goodnight, but that's it, right? Keep the list. And if you just keep the list and don't do all the wrong things, then you have made it. You're home free. But where did we get that idea? We say in our confession, forgive us for the things we have done and the things we have what? We've what? left undone. And if we spend our lives avoiding the risks of discipleship, being afraid to do the good that we know we ought to do, paralyzed by fear, if we simply live by the list of the things we're not supposed to do, then we're missing something key about the word faith. Seat belts and airbags and food safety inspections and parachutes are great for life but they're not good for faith. There's a member of our church who came to me and he was very concerned. He said, Tom, I don't believe any of this stuff. I come here and I sit here Sunday after Sunday and I, and I don't know if I believe any of it. And I said to him, you mean you come here and you sit here every Sunday and worship and you don't know if you believe? Yes. And you serve in breakfast on Broadway every month up here for four or five hours? And you don't know if you believe, yes. And you'll do anything anyone asks of you, anytime they need help, and you don't know if you believe, yes. And I said, you have more faith than anyone here. Because doubt is not the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. The one who is full of doubt but still acts is the most faithful has the most faith. What good is it to be sure of everything and yet your whole, all of your faith is about is just not doing anything wrong? We have been given a job to do. The biggest approach, the biggest problem with this just do nothing wrong approach to our Christian life is that the people we hurt the most are our young people. Churches are not losing the youth because church is too challenging or because the sermons are boring. Certainly not that. <laughs> or because the liturgy or the songs or anything like that. We lose our young people because we don't challenge them with a Christian life that goes out and changes the world. Young people and new Christians have this gift of naivete and that they actually believe this stuff when we tell them about it. And when we never challenge them, when we don't lead by example, when we don't show a strong, radical faith that can really say, just as I am, that can welcome everyone and love everyone, it leads them to believe that all of this church stuff 